and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Previously, we've ta we've come we've had him on for Curse of Bloodstone Isle, and the he and the mastermind behind Lost Lauren Games these days. Now coming with a flagship with his with his 5e plus setup, a mix between 5e and the good old storyteller, the one and only Mark Reinhagen. I'm pretty sure I got it right this time. <laughs> Ryan Hagen. Ryan Hagen. Damn it. That doesn't matter. I honestly don't. Don't you know? Yeah. The whole idea is to have people pronounce things in different ways. That's what an accent is, right? And and a world without accents would be a very boring world. Yeah. Although I um, love accents. I've got. Um, I think I told you before. One of one of my one of the people at my table has the unholy combination of a thick accent and he talks like an auctioneer. Oh, oh, great. I love that. Well, there, that there's, sounds awesome. There's been times where I've had to do the gag of smacking him upside the head and say, dude, slow down. <laughs> or, hit, or hitting him with a... There, I would be lying if I said there wasn't at least one time where I reached over the table and hit him with a rolled up newspaper. Yeah, I've been trying to work on my uh, auctioneer patter for years, and I just don't have it. The closest I can get is, hey, bada, 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 so wing, bada. Mm -hmm. so, Which I think is like a, an auctioneer style. It's like a practice mm -hmm. line. Yeah. So I'd, I, would like to, oh, I would like to open up with... Um, with this whole with this whole five E plus thing that you're do, that you're doing, um, this this midway point between um, D and D fifth edition and storyteller. Um, how did the how did the initial idea come up? Was it ju was it just was it just one of those crazy ideas that just persisted, or was there a different? <laughs> route? Well, I'm second thinking it now, as I always tend to do as we get closer to the publication. But yeah, basically, uh, you know, the famous bank robber, Willie Sutton, was asked once, um, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. And so the way I think about this concept is, you know, why are we doing D20? Um, why are we doing, you know, something that's so old school? Is that, well, that's where the players are. Like D and D had a huge renaissance, and the rest of gaming didn't. So we're back in the similar position that we kind of were back in the early '90s with Vampire. Mm -hmm. You know, um, whether I like it or not, my target audience plays D and D, and um, I happen to um, start watching some of these uh, podcasts with D and D, and I went, "Wait a minute, they're playing D and D, and they still, of course, have you know some of these dumb races and all that." Uh, well, I say dumb races. For, for me, as a, someone who loves a bespoke world, carefully designed to make sense and hold together and have resonance, you know, the way d d works with all the different races and all that is it, kind of silly, you know. But, but I understand that it works great for role playing, you know, and, and lets people do what they want to do. So I'm not that critical. But anyway, I saw what these people were doing. I was going, wait a minute. That's my style of gaming. That's storytelling. You know, they're not using rules. There's no two-hour combats. This is completely different. And I was like, wait a minute. What if I use, what if I take the, the you know, the, the 5e e d 20 rules and then completely change it? <laughs> not completely. Like, still use the dice. Still use all the concepts people love. But change them so that everything makes sense. And everything is in a bespoke world with their own birthrights instead of races guilds instead of classes and um you know everything is diegetic you know so that it makes sense in the world mm -hmm. you know the, the, the word diegetic oh yeah so, so like tarantino if, if the audience doesn't so diegetic is like how tarantino's movies you know usually the soundtrack is the character hears on the radio and cranks it and then that you hear that song in the movie so 
not only are you hearing it as an audience, but the character is hearing it. So you're with the character. And that's why I don't like things in, in D&D like level and class because they're not diegetic. You don't, you know, if you notice people playing D&D, they don't usually talk out loud, oh, my character class is this. Because that's a war gaming term and level. Like you wouldn't say level. That's why we have, oh, my guild is Herald or my guild is, uh, you know, um, Duskwatch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and uh, or I'm a spinster. I'm a storyteller. And my rank is this. So we just use these terms. And just by doing that, we make it diegetic because you're part of a guild and there's a 10 ranks of adept, which is like your journey. Like you're, And then there's 10 ranks of master, which is in D&D, 11th through 20th level. And so just by these simple little changes, um, we kind of rationalize and, and make sense out of these things that everyone knows so well, even if you don't play D&D, everyone knows there's 20 levels, right? <laughs> and and so this way, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get both the, we can make it really easy to pull in people and have them try it out. Because what's, what in every gaming group, right? If you play D&D, there's always be one person goes, I like D&D because it's what I understand. I don't want to try something new. And that's the biggest thing, preventing gaming groups from trying something different, mm-hmm. right? It's always that one person. And then, you know, you don't want to push that one person something they don't want to do. And so that one person is veto power. And by the way, I agree with that. That's how friends should be. Like, friendship should be about veto power. If someone doesn't want to switch with what you do, then you, you try to make convince them. If you can't, then you don't. Mm-hmm. But, but the idea behind this is that, hey, we're giving them – the storytelling teller system from World of Darkness, we're giving them narrativist, we're giving them something that can really change their style and be much more like the style of play you see on these podcasts and these vlogs. Mm-hmm. But it's in the vernacular, it's in the language that everyone in gaming is familiar with. Even if they hate D&D, they know this language. Ever, it's, so it's a common language. It's the trade done as we say in Lost Learn, you know, it's the lingua franca. Yeah. And that's why I did it. Now, I've sometimes, I, when it comes to this sort of thing, I've sometimes asked the, which, the question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it a case where you ended up creating the world of Lost Lorn and, the, and then created the set and then creating the rule set or was it the other way around? Uh, kind of a mix, but the world of Lost Learn is actually my, my very first world I ever invented. I've been working on this since I was first started playing D and D and started writing my world. Mm-hmm. This is something I've been working on for my entire life. And so, <laughs> for, for, <laughs> and, and there's ideas from back then, which I was so excited by, you know, that are in this game. It's just kind of cool, you know, that, that these these monsters and these concepts and, and, you know, this idea of a, of a giant world surrounded by a tempest storm, always circling. Uh, and, and you're kind of trapped and, and, this, and the world is kind of a jail, um, kind of a purgatory. I mean, those are ideas I had when I was a little kid. And uh, so it's grown from that. And then uh, once I realized it was going to be D and D, that's when, or at least five E and D twenty. I shouldn't say D and D; it's not D and D, but it's similar enough to D and D that D and D players have no problem playing it. Yeah, they just have to learn a few new wor- words, a few new rules, but it should be fairly fam- familiar, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that that, but as D it's D twenty done with kind of a storytelling flavor, you know. Mm-hmm. And let's face it, you can do storytelling with any game system. We all know this. Yeah. You know? And since, since you're integrating it, one, thi- one thing I should have asked you the last time I had you on, it just, it just didn't cross my mind at the moment. Um, when it came to designing Storyteller, what was the inspiration to go with the whole dot thing? Oh, um, yeah. The idea behind that is that... Um, like a lot of us love math. Like I love math. I love numbers. I love everything about it. And um, and so I think it's very easy for us 
though who have easy time with math to be not understanding that a lot of people are really scared of math. And so my idea was with World of Darkness is that if you can get rid of as many numbers as you can, if you can get rid of all the numbers in the sh character sheet and make it number less, that it becomes incredibly less scary to a lot of people who might otherwise not want to role play. Mm -hmm. And so the the dots, that's why I did the dots. And, and that's why a lot of people who would never role played before started playing my game. And that's when girls, right? <laughs> you know, like, like a, the thing I'm most proud of in my entire life is that after Vampire came out, you know, everyone in the game industry came up to me and as their joke was, hey, Mark, I can't believe you integrated gaming. There's girls here. And, you know, I'm really proud of that. And I really worked hard at that by having non-sexist language. And all well, actually, every book I've ever read, written, is non-sexist, starting in the 80s with Ars Magica. But, but also doing things um, like, like for people who are not, and I'm not saying girls are bad at math. They're not. In fact, there might be intrinsically better than boys in some ways anyway i shouldn't say that either but but anyway um for people who were not gamers like i was going for the goths with vampire the masquerade i was going for for non-gamers and uh and it certainly brought a lot of people into the industry right like vampire brought in a whole bunch of people and a lot of them were and were allergic to math shall we say you know whereas the original D, &D crowd loved math mm-hmm Ten, tended to at least so that's why i did it yeah and it's fun it's funny you mentioned that that kind of thing about getting rid of the math because well that's ba that's basically what not the end did <laughs> yeah 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 it's it's a it's a solid idea and i've spoken about it for years mm -hmm. <laughs> um but i think i think we should get into what style of fantasy lost lord is because with the silliness you've mentioned of the of the way D and D handles fantasy with that whole throw thing, that whole grab bag approach, um, instead of in something something cohesive, there's a bit there. There's a myth that I've that I've poked fun at with D and D for years. That whole idea of ru of running any kind of fantasy, when certain st certain styles like say, like say. Like say if somebody wanted to somebody wanted to run a more fertile crescent style of fantasy, um, or even more a more Japanese style, that would that would create some problems, because just use the just using the Japan example, how are you going to how are you going to um, insist how are you going to have sword and board in it in a in a culture that doesn't use shields. <laughs> But well, the way the way we do it in Lost Lord is that uh, in Lost Lord, there's all these um, metal born who've lived on Lost Lord for at least a thousand, in some cases, m tens of thousands of years, and they've been changed by the uncanny yeah. that infuses Lost Lord. But the pure born have come through, and they've come through from where? From Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Earth, basically. Yeah. And uh, so we have all these different kingdoms based on different actual peoples on earth so you there is a japanese uh kingdom there's a you know uh, an egyptian one there's a french one an africa uh, um um uh, you know uh, um a russian you know mm -hmm. and, and and the way we do it is that we say that their cultures have mixed a little bit you know so they they do have a they have do have some commonalities of the lost learn shield which looks a little bit like a diamond on a playing card Mm -hmm. and, and so they have this commonalities that they also have some unique things as well. And they have more traditional people living in their culture. They have less traditional people. So, so basically it's up to people to decide how far they want to take it. And in your own individual gaming group, I don't think culture appropriation should be a concern because it's just you and your group of friends. You can work it out, you know, and yeah. for people who are going to, you know, publicly show their games, you know, like in our broadcast or whatever, or for us, you know, where we're printing books, we have to be more careful. We don't want to offend anyone, but but generally, I feel like we should be showing how cool our world is and how wonderful these varied traditions are, and showing them, and and not trying to hide them and saying, oh, only 
Only a Japanese person can talk about this tea ceremony. No, I love the tea ceremony. Everyone should be able to talk about the tea ceremony. Everyone should be able to do the tea ceremony. And moreover, anyone should be able to borrow ideas from the tea ceremony and make that into something else. So that's why in our upcoming game, Fang Night, they have the blood ceremony, which is basically the tea ceremony, but the vampires do it with blood. Yeah. Now, what where I was going with that was was on um, was on what's was on what style of fantasy Lost Lorne is go is going for as a setting. Okay. Um, uh, what's the question? Sorry. Like, like, are you go? Are you going for? Are you going for dark fantasy? Are you going for something a bit Renaissance leaning? Um, that's ki that's kind of where that's kind of where I was aiming that particular question. Uh, okay. So so yeah, basically the world is uh, Renaissance at least in the big cities, and mm -hmm. um, but um, but they can't use like cannons and gunpowder wherever there's the Sacra Dwimmer. So wherever the church holds sway and it's like gunpowder tends to not work and it fizzles out. And so that's why it's sort of more early Renaissance, but yet they have these big factories powered by giant, um, you know, windmills, these huge windmills or giant water mills, but they don't have steam power at all. That's industrial. But, um, but then you get out to the mountains away from the lowlands and there it's much more medieval and, and uh, you know, and so you have this wild mixture. You have knights on, on uh, you know, on horseback. And then you also have people with muskets and pistols, you know, but, but the trouble with your musket and pistols is not going to work everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but underground in the abysmas, which are underneath Blightlands, you know, these sort of vast, you know, terrifying places. Uh, underground, yeah, gunpowder works just fine in the profana. So, you know, but uh, in the more quote unquote mundane lands, it doesn't. And and there's seven different dwimmers, uh, and they each have different effects and different things work. And that creates a texture depending on what kind of you know scene you want to run or what kind of combat that will have very different feelings and so it's a great way to get players a wide variety of things and in any scene you can have one two or even three dwimmer working mm -hmm. so like you can imagine there's a ton of combinations you can do to, to give a unique sort of texture to any scene you want yeah and all the powers of course work within the dwimmer mm -hmm. so since you talk since you talked about um not being not being a fan of cl not being a fan of classes Actually, you know what? Let me hold off on that because there's some, there's a few th before I can even get into some of the character creation quirks. There's a few things with the core system that I w that I want to get into. The first is the crux dice, and and just the whole thing of ga of of gaining crux. Yeah, um, I'm so proud of the crux dice. How did that? How did that particular thing come about? Uh, um. The escalation dice that they have in Thirteenth Age, oh yeah, uh, um, was something that was uh, that I kind of used to do in my games back, our Smogica games way back in the day, and I would just have this big dice, and I would just as the combat went on, I would just click the dice higher and higher, you know, and and and, and the higher the dice was the more reckless and crazy things got. And so it kind of was a tension builder, right? And But it didn't really have any mechanics. And what they did that was so genius, uh, I thought, in, in 13th Age, is they made it actually have a mechanical effect, is that it actually added to everyone, both yours and your opponent's two hit rolls, you know? Mm -hmm. But I thought it's a little bit hard to keep track of and all that. So we just made it so that there's not one dice but for each side in the combat, generally it's you versus them, but not always. But for each side, it has a giant D6. And then as your morale goes up and down, as your your confidence goes up and down as a team, your crux dice goes up and down. And, and therefore, you could win a combat simply by getting above six. And then they failed a morale roll and they've run away. And let's face it, running away... 
happens all the time in war and mm -hmm. combat. And if you've ever been a street fighter, and I haven't, but I've seen a ton of street fights, a lot of them. I used to own a lot of bars. Um, that happens all the time. People, you know, they may yell and threaten, but they're fucking running away. You know what I'm saying? Oh, excuse me. Pardon my French. Oh, uh, no, wor no worries. No need. No need to. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just I don't want to offend anyone in the audience, but um, it is I, physically impossible. It is physically I have, I have a terrible. I have a terrible problem with, with swearing in that. It I, is physically I, I, I impossible to offend to offend anyone in my audience. I can guarantee. Okay. You that. Okay. Good. 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 Like I, I, <laughs> we are, we here in the monastery are not uh, um run th run things a little differently than some, um, like I said, op like I said, open bar of the internet and. Things are th words are gonna fly, and and that's the f and that's the fun part for me. <laughs> Good. So, I think the I think the other thing to to cover is the is the almost bidding war style that you're doing with initiative, instead of initiative yeah. being being rolled right out of the gate. You're treating you're treating it like a like a secret bid, as yeah. well as Try, as well as integrating the um, the action modifier, try, basically trying to be a halfway point between the t between the tick system you had with storyteller. Yeah, I'm really uh, pleased with that, and uh, I think it's gonna be something really unique. And um, I'm just you know the only thing I'm worried about is it'll take up too much time because you have to do it every turn, mm -hmm. but everyone does it at the same time and you're hiding it. So it's not like you have to wait for someone else to decide. You're all doing it at the same time. And we have a rule in there that if someone is slow, then, you know, it's, they have to, it's whatever their initiative is. So they don't get to choose. It's just their standard initiative. So at the moment that the tail spinner calls it and says the gate tail spinner is the game master, mm -hmm. the tail spinner calls it. Boom. If you don't have a number on there or, or you don't reveal your hand right away, it is your just initiative number, which is a good result for you because it that's, you know, that's as fast as you can go. But we made the system so that sometimes you don't want to be the first if you have a plan. And so if you don't want to worry about it, you don't even put your hand out. You just wave away and, and you're not worried about it. So that means it's your initiative, which is written on one of the five shields on your character sheet, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think that's... Uh, I think people are going to be really happy because it, it makes every single turn of the combat interesting and, and different. And it, it uh, it's sort of part of this whole um, push your luck, you know, do, do things to change things, play with the rules, you know, and people always think, Oh, Mark loves storytelling. He's a narrativist guy. He hates gaming. No, man, I love the gaming side of, of role-playing. I, I love mini-maxing. I, I just don't want the mini-maxing to get in the way of the story. I don't want it to get in the way of the role-playing. But, but if I'm gaming in a game, I'm always mini-maxing. I want to play the game part of the game. For me, that's part of role-playing. The trouble is most games don't let you have fun with it. They're not designed to let you freaking have fun with the gamest part of it. And and this game is designed to be fun, if you for that gaming part of your personality. And I definitely have that. I'm a, I started as a war gamer as a chess player. I'm totally into that. And and by starting with D and D, by the way, it kind of freed me up in a weird way to kind of just go all in on that. You know, I just did it. I just went all in in ways that wouldn't slow down the game. Mm -hmm. That's all. Now, with that in, with that in mind, what I'd like to what I'd like to delve into a, for a bit for a bit is the fact that instead of going with the basic six, you added a you added an additional ability score. Uh, Set again, sorry. Um, instead of going with instead of going. While you while the basic six is still there, you added an additional ability score. Um, that being uncanny. Yeah, 
the seventh. Mm-hmm. The seventh ability. Yeah, seventh is a magic number. Um, so what's what's the question about it? Um, I'm more I'm more curious if it's if it's something if the idea of a additional ability score was something that you can was something that you came to early early on, or if it was or if in those early phases you wanted to try and keep it to six, but it had to be at it had to be seven. Uh, no, no. I mean, I knew from the beginning I wanted to add an ability score, and I wanted it to be something connected to you know, the magic. And I, I've always made fun of Sandy Peterson, you know, who, by the way, when I say I make fun of him, I love Sandy Peterson. He's the nicest, most wonderful person you'll ever meet and an incredibly talented game designer. I love Sandy Peterson. He's a mm-hmm. wonderful human being. Um, but I've always made fun of him that in Call of Cthulhu, they call their magic power, power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And I just think it's so funny. It's the worst word, you know? And, and it's just very simple, though. And I get that. So, yeah. But I knew I wanted to do something. And I've always loved the word uncanny. And so for years and years and years, I've always known that if I was going to add a new ability to something, it was going to be uncanny. Mm-hmm. So, and because I, I love that word. I love it. So that was obviously what I was going to call it. Now I fall in love with words, mm-hmm. you know, as anyone knows, who's read my games is that I'm a word guy and my setting, the settings I create, the worlds I create are really truly based around words. And I believe words are magic or magical power and they're key to storytelling and that every word is a magical spell and that a word opens up in the mind of the person who speaks it or hears it a whole it's like a spell. It works like a spell, you know? And these, these, these certain words have much more power than other words, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so uncanny is one of those words. It just works. I, I love uncanny. Yeah. Uh, now, give, now, given that, given that, uh, I'd say, I'd say the other, I'd say something else I do find I do find it. I do find interesting. Is the is the whole th- is the whole thing with things like omens with things like omen sight with the other sight other sight. I don't know. I don't know why I said omen sight. <laughs> hey, you, 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 I'm really pleased you read the PDF, man. That's freaking mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Oh, did, did we? By the way, do we have bookmarks on that PDF or not? Um. On you have you have bookmarks on one on one of them. There were three there were three PDFs that that I got from Drive Through RPG. Um, I would advi- I would advise with with one of them the the one that was titled Base Six is done. Um, nah, if if not doing um not doing double pages like that. Uh, and no double pages. Yeah, the get is it. It gets kind of messy when one of them is single pages and the other one is double pages. A lot of okay. people, a lot of people. I, just, I like, just wrote my team. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of people on like I appreciate it. On like it, some some developers I've seen on itch or or drive through RPG will ha- will have the option of single pages or double pages, but given this kind of preview. It's just it's just a little haphazard to have a twin to have a document that it one document that's double page and one that's single page. Yeah, yeah, great feedback. And by the way, anyone in the audience, if you have feedback for us, please write me mm-hmm. or write the company. Uh, we're lostlorngames.com or I'm Mark Reinhagen on Facebook and Twitter. Just let me know, man. I, I you know, as long as you're not too mean. Or, or, or you can be you can be extremely mean if you're also funny, and I'll I'll love it. But you got to be a little bit funny, or at least trying to be funny. Yeah. Uh, extremely mean and not funny, I, I it really hurts my feelings. <laughs> but I still don't get mad, by the yeah. way. But please don't do it. I I I, I love having. I, I'm a really mellow person, mm-hmm. uh, and I love having wonderful days. Yeah. <laughs> now 
and I have kids. So me me being happy all the time is really great for kids. Yeah. You know, now one of the th one of the things that I of co I of course found interesting is the concept, not just the concept of birthright and guild, which I'd say I'd say is your I'd say is your approximation of what would be ra what would be race or and class in other games. Yeah. But also also the fact that your choice of birthright and guild plays a plays a factor on on multiple levels even even at the later stages of of character creation like th like things like powers both of them yeah. play a factor instead of ju instead of just one of them playing a factor cuz if i'm being honest once you're once you're past first level oh uh, race doesn't matter all that much in D&D &D. yeah yeah but well, we made it so that you get a new power when you become a master level mhm mm so when you get to basically what in DD is called eleventh level, what we call first rank master, yeah, you suddenly get a whole new power because of your your race. And then also another reason we do that, by the way, is that I noticed um, looking at the DM's guild stats is that almost no one plays D and D tenth level or above. Yeah, I, like did, I did. I did a video. Rare. I did and a I was video like, talking well, about why that. do they have all these rules for shit when no one ever does it? Um, like it must the game must not work anymore. I'm and I was like, well, f I, one of the big things I told the team as I said, for sure, this game needs to work at a high at master level ranks. It has to work, and people have to want to get there. You know, and if that means they get up go up a rank quicker, fine, no problem. Yeah. You know. So you can jump up a, a rank every every game session, not a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? er, earlier this earlier this week, I did a vi I did a video exploring, uh, exploring that whole high level drop off thing. Yeah. Um, there are a com there are a combination of factors, and I did ask my good friend Ta my good friend Tanner, the developer of a five E hack called Heavens and Heresies, what he thought about it. Yeah. And. I think it. I think it's. I honestly think the. I honestly think the big reason why is a lack of guidance and an over reliance on an over reliance on CR on ch on challenge rating, which I've always had issues with, even back in two thousand. But one of the bigger ones is I'd li I'd likened it to how Blizzard has had this problem where they're. Really, when it comes to rating, they're really catering to the world first um, crowd. With the, with a lot of the raids recently in World of Warcraft, and try and trying to make raids. What's world first mean? Basic, basically the basically the first guild or or whatnot to be to complete a raid successfully. Ah, uh, uh, and okay. they've been making raids. So they're playing to their hardcore fans, but not the general population. Yeah, and the thing the thing is it it's it hasn't it hasn't priced out peop, a lot of people, but it means that in, for a lot of raids, the amount of coordinating coordination that is necessary is be, has become unreasonable. Um, I remember Asmund Gold doing a Asmund Gold and Bellular doing whole videos on the matter. Um, I think D and D has has had kind of a similar problem in reverse of. Cater catering so much to that to those first few levels to that en to that entry level play, but not giving any support to the high level play. Uh, say the last line again. Sorry. Um, oh, not give not giving a whole lot of support to the high to the high level play because so much of the attention is focused on the the um early play. Uh, I see what you're saying. Now. Yeah, yeah, and I. And, and 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 honestly, high level play is the hardest to calculate. It's so hard for game designers. It's really difficult. So I understand why they don't. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm a storytelling guy, right? So you can't complete the story without without having without leading your character all the way from zero to hero. Mm -hmm. You know, and a true hero is high level. Maybe not. You know, master rank 10, 20th level, mm -hmm. but at least master something, you know, 
like I don't want to I don't want my character to retire until master. And so that's why I'm really proud that we have adept one through ten and master one through ten. Because that means in Badlander and our other games coming out, uh Fang Knight, Bane Knight, which is the werewolf, Fang Knight is Vampire, mm-hmm. um, that people will want to at least get to master rank one. You know, because who wants to retire their character close to master but not quite there? Nope. You're going to want to at least be master level one, right? Yeah. Master rank one. And, and, and so I'm hoping this is a way to at least get people to, to not just play their rite of passage story again and again and again, which I, and believe me, I love a buildings roman. I love a rite of passage. I love a, a novel of building story. I love someone becoming from nothing to something. Mm-hmm. I love that story. I love a, a story about a kid growing up. Man, that's why I love teen movies. But there's something about telling a story of a character from life till death that is beautiful. Yeah. Um, as as nice as 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 nice as the. I think it. I think one. I think one of the best examples of that kind of that kind of thing. Um, are you familiar with a with a old school style game called Adventure Conqueror King System? I uh, I I read games like game rule systems like Candy, and I read reviews like like straight hits of sugar, and I gotta say I've never heard of it. Um, That's embarrassing. Adventure Conqueror King System, which, in full disclosure, um, the devel- the developer has been on this show and is and is a friend of mine. But I apologize, friend. I do. <laughs> I I thought I knew every game system, but obviously I don't. Even I, I know a whole lot of game systems. Even I, and even I've never said I know every game system. Um, you but... understand? I I am I, even when I was working full time in politics, I was obsessive about reading everything. Mm-hmm. But, but obviously, I haven't. I, you know, I'm I'm embarrassed. What but, year was it? When, when did it come out? Um, this came out. It came out a few years ago, and it's still it still gets a fair amount of support. It's getting a dwarven themed expansion, um, fairly soon. Okay. Um, what was it called? Conqueror. Adventurer. Co- adve- in fact, let me let me write it out in the um. Co- let me write it out in. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna uh, write it out. Adventure the- Conqueror King System. Yep. Oh wow, it looks cool. And one of the one of the key conceits is that it wanted to put a bit more emf- a bit more attention on the end game. Um, it is using it's using BX rules as a ba- BX D and D as a base. And the idea the idea is that level is that leveling is in in three tiers. An adventurer. Um, where you're ju- where you're just your standard run of the mill adventure, a conqueror where you're start you're starting to get a following and get followers, and every class in it gets followers. Um, and king where you have a whole lot more and possibly have some sort of holding, whether it be a castle, a wizard's tower, something like that. And. Looks cool. Yeah, I'm reading it now and on that, drive-thru. Um, I I it's a point free that plug, Steve Steve Wick. It's a free plug. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I pl- I've I've reviewed I've reviewed it on this channel, and I've ta- I've talked about how I've talked about how it's covering a covering that end game concept that was te- that was teased in A D and D, but never full but never fully explored. Um, and I, I always, I always try and recommend it because it's one of my, it's one of my favorite retro clones. Although Neo Clone would be more, would be more accurate with some of the stuff that it does. Chief, chiefly among them, the fact that it's hard to cast the high level spells in that system without getting help. With the understood assumption that if you, once you unlock spells of that tier, you're going to have followers as it is. But to shift that to shift that over into your system um one thing that i noticed is that you have you have guilds which we talked about but also adept and master lodges now one thing i'm curious about when it comes to get when it comes to guilds since 
Storyteller is a more free form, and D20 is a more structured method of advancement. Um, when it comes to guilds, as as well as well as lodges, is it a is it a case where the, where um where what you get out of them is going to is is going to is going to involve certain features, or is it is it is it mostly things like um, feats, edges, and disciplines? Um, well, I mean, we have the, uh, for each guild, we have the two levels of the, um, uh, I can't remember the name right now. The, it's the social powers, you know, for mm -hmm. each guild, the, um, uh, letters of Mark. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, along those lines, we want to make it so like, like, like that's, it's actually written in the, I don't know if you got the second book. We have a second book that it, actually Badlanders two different books. There's the player's book and then there's the game master's book. And in the game master's book, we actually explain how when players become masters, like everything changes. Their social status, they're effectively no longer a knight. They're the guild equivalent of a lord. You know, they're they're quite they're quite high status. They're quite respected. Mm -hmm. And but with that goes a bunch of responsibilities. And, and, and so um, a bunch of the stuff changes. And then also in that book, we have a whole um, chapter, a very large chapter on creating your fury. So, so basically we have a fury character sheet uh, and that is your, basically your group. And then when you become masters, you suddenly have a bunch more responsibilities and powers and, and things change a lot. And so, so, so basically on that, we have a whole thing where a master is a whole different thing. And by the way, when we're done laying that out, I'll be glad to send that to you. It's just not completely laid out yet. Yeah. But we're um, unusual in that, by the way, everyone listening, that like we actually not only write, but we lay out our books before the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And that means that 15 days after the Kickstarter is done, you get your PDFs. And hopefully this time, within a month, or two of the Kickstarter ending, hopefully mm -hmm. you'll have your book. Yeah. And, and I, I just think that's such a cool thing. Like if we can do that, it'll be so awesome. Like, especially in this age where everyone prints in China and everything's late by years, you know? So we print in the, in North America, uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, that's the, you know, it's the same as printing the USA. Are you American, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm very much about you know. Uh, I grew up in a small town. I, I I like bring you know local people, and uh, so for me it was a big deal to print in North America. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, that's the whole that's the whole idea is that. Um, yeah, Masters is a whole other... It's a big deal. It's mm -hmm. a big, big deal. And yeah. it's social as well as powers. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely powers. Yeah, and I'm, ge I'm guessing... I'm guessing things like Adept and Master Lodges are are somewhat analogous to, um, su to subclasses or even prestige classes. Well, I mean, I would say it in a non-gaming way. I would say they're secret societies. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're basically that. Like, like if you want to see it in D and D terms, or like that. But really, you know, they're the all the six societies basically grew out of the guilds in our history, right? Like mm -hmm. even the Illuminati, which are basically just like a bunch of people going, "Hey, we shouldn't have kings. We should have democracy." That's what the Illuminati really was. It's a bunch of people going, "We should have democracy," and then some, one of the German princes found out about it and basically went on a 30 year rampage and killed them all, <laughs> you know, but basically they're just a bunch of people saying, Hey, they're like, like the American founding fathers, except they live in a country where the ruling King was like, yeah, you can't get rid of me. Uh, but anyway, that, that grew out of the guild system. The guild was, uh, you know, Hey, we're protecting our secret lore and, and a lot of the Masons, right. They grew out of what? The masons, like literal masons, architects, mm -hmm. builders. 
And so anyway, that I, I'm deeply into all that stuff. Yeah. And part of the part of the reason that I do that I that I brought it up in, in that in that analogous form with you with using with using some of D&D's terms is is just as a means to make the transition e make the transition easier. Yeah, no, I mean and I do thank you for that cuz um um cuz the audience will definitely understand what you're saying. Mhm. Mm you know, I, I just wanted to add to it that, you know, uh, if anyone's there from the world of darkness, uh, <laughs> they'll understand that that there's another way to see it as well. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's actually feedback we're getting a lot. A lot of people are saying, oh, I don't play 5e. I play World of Darkness. I play indie games. And I'm like, well, you know, we're 5e, but we're also an indie game. We're also dots. And, yeah. and, and a lot of people are very anti-D&D. &D, and I'm just not down with that like now i'll admit when i wrote vampire was i anti D, &D? yes i had contempt i'll admit it but D, D then was a very different game it was much more basic much more rough um but there were even in the early 90s eight, late 80s there's some good things about D, D. first of all the whole tradition of house rules and just doing whatever you want using it any way you wanted that was that's always been fantastic Role playing has has really benefited by that attitude of, you know, the the game master and the troop of players get to do anything they want. Mm -hmm. They get to interpret the rules in a way they want. I love that. Do you find that in board games? Oh, um, not so much. I'd say I'd say it's trick. I've seen I've seen some war games pop up over the over the last few years that are a bit more open source. Yeah. But it is it is some it is somewhat uncommon in in wargaming. Um, personally, what I've what I've found interesting of late is see, is seeing is seeing people focus less and less on trying to be compatible with five e with five e and instead using five e's rule set to do to do these overhauls into completely new games. Um, whether that be level up, um, heavens and heresies, magi knights, or even even something like five e plus. Oh, yeah. And a couple a couple of those pro a couple of those projects I mentioned are currently in are currently in the development phase of things. Um, and yeah, I think I think I think Dee Dee's coming along and like. And Ray Winninger, one of my old friends, who, by the way, used to be the front man for the Beastie Boys, little known fact. I don't know if he wants anyone to know that, but <laughs> Ray Winninger, who's running D&D, uh, used to be the guy standing at the front of the stage with the Beastie Boys. I'm a huge Beastie Boys fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and was revving the crowd and doing raps. Yeah. <laughs> and now he's running D&D, which I think is hilarious. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm really, really. I think he's going to do some great things for D and D, but I think he's in a, also in an impossible situation. You know, like like doing a five point five, just like doing three point five. It's yeah. just a very, very difficult position to be in. Um, I met. I mentioned. Um, I mentioned Fantasy Crafts previously. That was that was basically crafty games breaking down three point five D and D, and then re and then rebuilding it from the ground up. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I remember it. The and since and you mentioned and of course with thirteenth age that's that that's a hybrid of third and fourth editions um philosophies. Yeah. But it had the third and fourth edition guys doing it. <laughs> yeah. And with that with that in mind when it comes to when it comes to the full book for for um bet for badlander yeah um, what do you are you i'm guessing you're going i'm guessing of course you're going to be splitting into into a players into a player facing book and a gm facing book yeah um, no, no, the book the book you read was the player book that's 288 pages of player goodness and there's a second book that's not done yet so we couldn't send it to you um, I didn't read. I didn't read that. Yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. I should have sent it to you. I, I, um, 
yeah, the only I thing I had, the only thing I've I've had that I've used that I've used in my research up to this point was the was the quick start. Oh my goodness! Oh, okay. I, I would have sent you the PDF of the full thing. <laughs> oh, I'm, I apologize, man. I, I'm yeah. I, uh, no sorry, worries. Sorry. I, my, my father-in-law is in the hospital, and it's been a busy uh, busy time lately. Yeah, that's why that's why I didn't put that's why I didn't press the matter. Yeah, that was very nice of you, by the way. But um, now you can, because he just called me and said he's great. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm, I'm very happy. Um, when when do you plan? Do you have a window you in mind for when you plan on launching the Kickstarter? We have a date, which is this month, the twenty second. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, at. Act in fact, uh, it'll be like East Coast time, like mm -hmm. ten o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so mid, so mid afternoon for you. Yeah, yeah, it's because crazy. Damn time zones. If I haven't, yeah, made, if yeah. I haven't made it clear, I the hate time zones. Hard, man. Hmm? Yeah, living living so far away. Oh, it's the twenty first. Sorry, not the twenty second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Tuesday. Yep. Which I can I can I can certainly get I can certainly get behind. And, and we're gonna have a special deal for anyone who um, basically um, jumps in in the first hour, mm -hmm. because um, simply because Kickstarter, if you get funded in the first hour, you get huge bonuses. So we got everything lined up to try and fund in the first hour. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, just for anyone who wants to know, you get you get a bunch of extra shit. Yeah, and how and you can go and sign up right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Badlander on um, Kickstarter. He'd leave your email, and you'll be informed of everything. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I'm guessing you're planning on on going for going for a 30 day campaign. Yeah, yeah. I've been advised to do shorter, but I've also been advised to do longer. And and honestly, I don't make these decisions anymore. I'm creative director. I focus on that stuff. And I have an incredible team, a CEO, a CFO, marketing director, team leaders, developers, editing lead, layout, art director. I mean, it's amazing. Like, I've been so blessed with this insanely talented team of people who are you know, waiting for the Kickstarter to get to get paid like they did last time. And um, and and by the way, I, I don't make any money from these. Um, you know, because of my past, I don't need it. And um, long term, I'm sure it'll work out for me. But I, I'm just so thrilled to be working with people and helping them get a start in the industry and people from all walks of life. You know, mm -hmm. and we have we have a homeless person working for us. You know. Like, I'm so proud of that. People from all over the world, so proud of that. Developing mm -hmm. countries, people with English as a second language. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of thing that a lot of people in America don't tend to think about sometimes, you know, because we're, so we're so concerned about diversity in our own neighborhood, you know? And, and me, it's like, hey, I want, just from a selfish point of view, <laughs> I want diversity just to sort of get people's viewpoints and see what they think, you know, and have some cool shit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm selfish about it. Um, and, um, uh, so yeah, I'm sorry. I, I get all distracted. <laughs> no, no, wor <laughs> no worries. Um, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play around here. Hey, I had a great time. You're a great interviewer, man. You, you had really good questions and I can't believe you only got the quick start. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Hey, I'll be back for Fang Night. That's a promise. Mm -hmm. As as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I was drinking throughout this interview, <laughs> and I just had to hit a pot. Yeah. Uh, and of course, <laughs> of course, which by the way is legal here now in Tbilisi, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I'm very yeah. proud to say. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule 
to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your my gaming <laughs> Stay Sorry. fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>